so I've come up with a title for the podcast recently. I didn't have the title for it last time. Last time it was just like, here's a podcast. Yeah, here's some dudes, me dudes talking. Um, so I think I'm about being Irish and British. Yeah. That's like funky. That's a rough title for now. Yeah. yeah. I'm not actually being Irish and British. Mm-hmm. Just to give a wee bit more priority to Irish. N- n- there's not a priority or hierarchy, but yeah, no. sounds sounds all right. I think it's maybe to confuse people or to sort of cause a wee bit di- dis- not discord, but like jar. I don't know. Did you, did you watch that um, documentary and was it BT Sport or something? Uh, the Brian and Chris yeah. film. And here was a really open-minded guy, yeah. as open-minded as you could get, but he was really struggling with it, wasn't he? Yeah. Out of being British and Irish at the same time. I was thinking about that just recently because um, it, it was it was it went even further than that. It was him and Tommy Rose sitting in the stands, sort of laughing and giggling, sort of it's like these idiots, kind of thing. Like British and Irish, like what are they like, Swahili and Irish? I mean, and and in fact, actually, that would be seen as like very righteous and cool. Like, oh yeah, we got a Swahili guy. It's and like Tommy had been doing a bit of anthropology during his time at Ulster or something, just seeing how the natives lived. Yeah. Yeah, I, and the, but the weird thing with, with that as well is like, cause Tommy went to Royal School of Armagh, which is pretty. Yeah, you would have thought that he would have got quite a good grounding about what unionism was about and what yeah. how ultra Protestantism kind of felt about itself. Yeah, so I thought that did a bit of this this service, but I think um, it was really, good, really, I was really chill. I don't, I don't know that that production was. Very well timed, as well put together. Having Roy Best on was amazing. The only thing I thought could have done more was see more Stephen Ferris because yeah. you, you, you read his, his biography and then he talks about how he used to stop at McGaffrey, he used to build the bonfires. Oh, right. Uh, he seemed like he was as staunch as that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, uh, Yeah, and Roy Vest's comments were pretty, you know, broad. You know, he was just like, I'm British, I'm an Irish, I'm Irish, I'm British. Yeah, but I don't understand. I mean, we're quite comfortable with that duality to our identity, and we don't see a, a contradiction there. Um, but, I mean, and, and that's, why I would, that's why I would always argue that unionism is actually a more um, inclusive and tolerant kind of way of looking at things than nationalism, because... Nationalism sees the Irish state as having almost a monopoly in Irishness. Yeah. And this is where you get into these difficult conversations about sport. I mean, you've got a picture of Rory McIlroy up there. Yeah. Um, Rory McIlroy, when he indicated that he might play for Team GB in the Olympics, got dogs abused for, uh, about it on social media. And that might have even arguably changed his mind. And he's ended up, you know, or he will end up um, playing golf for for Ireland. Yeah. But the idea that you could um, be Irish and you could be British, and that maybe your political allegiance and your <laughs> cultural identity weren't exactly the same, or that they were somehow messed up and intertwined, was a very difficult concept for a lot of yeah, not Irish not nationals to get their head around. Not only difficult, I think, um, I guess up, up here, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know how exactly what I said, but I, I think, so I'm, I'm going to talk about down south again, because I've had a few experiences, and it's just completely an, an anathema, like, it's just like water and oil, you can be Irish American, you can be whatever, and of course, you know, with immigration and whatnot, a, a rainbow nation of identities and allegiances is, is right, right on, but the British and Irish just is inc- incompatible, totally fixed, and it can never be. And I just remember when I was down south, some drunk lady called me, oh, you're all Irish, up there. And I, I know I'm Irish. I just condescend away, even you tell me that. Yeah. I just sort of, but I'm British too. Oh, she was completely, that's appalling. Outraged, yeah. Started lecturing me and then started yelling. Um, well, <laughs> as part of the, as part of the, the attempt to talk about a shared Ireland and all this kind of thing. And one of the one of the things that amused me most about that is you get um, 
you had Sinn Féin actually doing it really blatantly a few years ago. What, what do they mean by unionism? What, what, do they, what do they mean by their Britishness? And it could never be that we mean just what we say that we mean, that we want to be part of the United Kingdom, yeah. that we have a political allegiance to the United Kingdom, yeah. and that we feel British. Yeah. We also feel Irish as well. Which yes. is you know, a different thing too, but why couldn't it just be what we said it was? Yeah, there's sort of there's two things on that. One thing I've sort of examined lately, it's it's very illuminating that these people who just being in complete bewilderment and confusion sign the British marriage and you mean this and other. These are the people now who are screaming, You're taking away my European identity mm-hmm. post Brexit, they're saying I have a dual identity and they're Right on my Twitter, and you're Irish and European. There's that, and then there's also um, if you look at it's more hardcore nationalist Republicans. They love, 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 love to talk. I, I'm guilty of this too. The Britishness here is nothing like Britishness across the water. Mm. Um, and if you look at but Britishness in Scotland is nothing like Britishness in the South of England. Yeah. Britishness in, in Wales is a different thing again. Yeah. Um, I know we, we, we both know Trevor England quite yeah. well. And Trevor has a fondness for saying that we're as Irish as Cork, but we're yeah. not the same as Cork. Yeah. And we're as British as Finchley, but we're not the same as Finchley. We're yeah. just not English. We're the Northern Irish British, is it? Yeah. Like? And that's what it is about, it's not. England out of Ireland, it's about Scotland, Wales, England and Northern Ireland together and it's just melting pot. Yeah, it's a, a multinational nation. Yeah. In a way. Well, it's, yeah, the, the, four, the four nations. Yes, but I mean, I, 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 I do, that there's arguments about this, is Britishness a nationality, is the United Kingdom actually a nation? I mean, in my view it is, it's kind of, it's, it's something that's almost nesting, it's, we have nations within a, a broader nation. Yeah, well, yeah, I suppose it's, it's open to inter- interpretation, but by and large, you know, I'm big into the rugby, so what's the five nations? Mm-hmm. And the, I think you used to have the four nations at one stage, or if not, it was a, it was a football competition, was it not called the four nations? Well, it was the home international, oh. uh, it was the home international tournament, which comprised the four nations. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a union of four, four nations. I, 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 I don't know what I'm saying is what I'm going call out a lot for this, but we need a constitutional lawyer to give a categorical answer. But, um, and then the, actually the other thing to say very quickly is the, the people who laugh, I remember I was at the Fianna Gale conference in 2015, 16, right? Okay. And it was again very early and um, and I met a guy, he was a boxer, working class dude, pretty hardcore, and he was, he, he was doing the inverse, mm-hmm. where Republicans laugh at lawyers and say, yeah, you're nothing like a British. He was saying, these Republicans laugh at these lawyers, are nothing like us. I walk around West Belfast and I'm like, what is this flipping uh, St. Patrick's Day in New York? Like, like Jesus, tone it down a bit, lads. Like, you know, you, you don't get it. The, the, so, well, I detect that things are kind of changing a bit now, particularly with the ascendancy of, of Sinn Féin in the Republic of Ireland and, and Republicanism's coming back and being a bit cooler. Yeah. But, you know, I, I remember when I would have been sort of late uh, teens, early twenties, every every year we would have gone down to um, to Galway or something that a ca- something like that, a car load of us, and we would have gone uh, kind of in and around the time of the Galway races. Uh, and, you and the family, and, uh, or talking about friends? No, talking about friends. Oh, yeah. We would have gone down and from, from so you're from Ballymena, a group of Ballymena lads. Yeah, yeah, a group of Ballymena lads. <laughs> Quite comfortable doing that. Yeah. You know, we, we used to go up and down to Oxygen and all of this oh, kind yeah, of stuff yeah, yeah. As, as well. So what's this like 2003? You would have been talking maybe even the late 90s, okay. to be honest with you. I'm not that <laughs> old. Um, and we would have got in the car and we would have gone for a bit of a road trip. We would have ended up yeah. in Galway. We might have stopped in Westport or something like that. Oh yeah. And um, you know the the only kind of Republican vibe that you ever got down there. The only people singing songs, playing the yeah. songs out of their cars and all that kind of thing, were northerners and there was always this sort of attitude from uh, from the local young people of that kind of reeling back from that, this isn't cool, we don't want to be associated with this. I mean, I actually remember at an Oxygen Festival, um, 
few of us have had a, a few pints and we started a, a chorus of we're not Brazil, we're Northern Ireland. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, the Southern guys were joining in on the guitar <laughs> and, and singing along. So, yes, I, I, don't, I don't know whether that's so much the case anymore, but there was this this kind of looking at the Northerners as a, as a bit strange and almost at times the Southern, the, the, the more kind of liberal Southern nationalists maybe seeing the, the liberal Northern Unionists as being closer to them than the, the kind of wilder Republicans. Yeah, I mean, so I yeah. don't know. But I, it's, again, it's probably like the English probably can relate more to the, I don't know what I was going to say, because the, Loyalists or something, unionists can be so on top of the British and so like, I can't follow that. I'd probably get yeah. on better with the Republican types or nationalists and like vice versa down south because they tail out nationalists from Cork or whatever. Like, Jesus, would you tone it down? Whatever your name is. Mm-hmm. And they'd probably have to prefer hanging out with these like the likes of me and you because we're just going to be a bit different too. Yeah. A different yeah. viewpoint. Well, just the flip side of that, the inverse, um, was not so many years ago when. Cuba with my wife for a honeymoon and uh, we got um, sort of you know the way hotels kind of invite groups of people along for a for a dinner and this, mm-hmm. these kind of things and um, I can't remember was it newlyweds or something like that anyway it was it was a dinner with a, with a whole pile of people and we were sitting next to some people from the home county yeah. they were chatting away about Ireland mm-hmm. and the guy was going oh you know there's um, the, the, the Irish are really cool, but the, the Northern Irish, they're very aggressive, don't like them at all. Yeah, that's all this kind of yeah. And then uh, at, at the end, he, he got through his whole spiel and he said, where, where are you from? <laughs> and you, you just see his wife's kind of oh, face shit. dropping. I, I know where these guys are from. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. The, they're the aggressive, ignorant yeah, Irish. Yeah, yeah. You know? But so, that, there's, there's this kind of really naive, um, idea among some English people that the Irish really, they're, they're cool and they really, uh, you know, that, that they feel that the Irish like them back or something. And I don't think that they've, they've really got an understanding of how there's, there's a deep antipathy there if you really want to tap into it, particularly uh, among some. Yeah, don't get me started on that. Some sections of society. Let's come straight to the fact that I talk about that antipathy, but I'll just say very quickly, Joe Brawley would talk about that, I think. Mm-hmm. Where he, he says there's more antagonism from boys down south, almost in the unionist ones up north. Um, I spoke to another, another boys from a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine. I'll give him a wee shout out. Um, Benny, he's a, he's a teacher, my friend, he's a friend of but he's from in the show in Donegal. He says he needs to pen down um, GA football down carrying a cork or something. Nah, what's it like? You know, like oh, you, so you, have you converted into Euros here? You know, they, 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 don't, they don't get. Um, yeah, they they thought Donegal was um was uh, part of um the UK. So right. they, they lack of understanding. That's that's not tied to exactly what, what what Joe Brawley said, but um. Well, I don't know, Joe. Uh, just on, on the subject of Joe Brawley, I mean, he, I think he let himself down at the start of the coronavirus crisis by ranting and raving about. English. Oh really? Yeah. So I don't know no, that no. he really has any room to talk. Yeah, I missed that because I, I. That's the one thing that's, that's got me got my back up with the realization. It was a global health crisis, and the the, 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 the the sort of almost hunger and sort of to, to see the British on the rise. Yes. And to create a division out of it. Yeah. Um, to to politicize it and make it about the border question. It's been, it's been appalling. I mean, uh, the, the Irish Times reported right at the start of the crisis that there was a guy from here, one of the first kind of coronavirus yeah. cases, who needed to go from Newcastle to Newcastle yeah. um, to get special treatment, that presumably to go into ICU or, or some kind of care that they could offer. And her own Michelle and Michelle according to the Irish Times, this is, um, attacked this move in, a, in a, an executive meeting on the basis that he should be going to Dublin instead. Really? This guy, r- you know, r- rather than where he would get the yeah. best care, yeah. which is the only thing that should have been under consideration at that yeah. point. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very, very cautious to say anything, but I'm just, I'm just like, telling you what happened. Um, I don't know what to say, I'm just sort of paying homage or whatever, but the late um, 
story. Um, what was his first name? Bobby. Bobby story. He, he, he unfortunately his lung transplant was unsuccessful. You know he obviously went for the best of the best. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that was in Newcastle in, in the UK. Yeah, well, I've heard this. Uh, you know, uh, you know well, but the, the fact is that that, that man is the spearhead of an armed campaign to break the link between Britain and Ireland. Well, when you're, it just goes to show that when you're sick and desperate, the kind of political connotations of something like that yeah. aren't that relevant to yeah. you. I suppose, um, hopefully this isn't too coherent, I just want to ask you, talk, bring this up quite quickly, because it just reminds me of something that we've looked at recently. Um, you know, when, when you just think about the geography of these two islands, mm -hmm. you know, four or five hundred years ago, it was easier to get from here over to Scotland. In, in, in many ways, you know, when you mentioned Westport, I remember getting a quick tour of Westport and Clifton. They said that was more or less landlocked because of the, mm -hmm. the geography of the mountains and the bogs, inaccessible. The only way you get there was by through, sea. By sea. Yeah. So, this idea that this one island unit is fixed and that's the way it has to be and it has to be self governing, as opposed to it ups and downs, changes, meanders, and it actually. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the kind of the history of. of of Ulster even and, and the Kingdom of Dalriada and, and the constant um, movement between Scotland and, and those counties in the north coast yeah. uh, that went on. I mean they, they, that was that was the unit because that was much easier to um, to travel than it was to get to Cork or even Dublin or, or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, the, no you're you're quite right. The idea that an island has to comprise a political entity is pretty out there and also you know why not the two islands comprising yeah. the political um, entity because we've got along mm -hmm. these islands we've, we've got far more in common than we do that separates yeah. us and we've got a kind I know that this is a point of um, grievance but we've got a common language we've got largely a common culture although we've got kind of variations on that and also increasingly they're saying that we've got common DNA as well, because yeah. this idea that there's separate Celtic DNA and Anglo-Saxon DNA, it's not really borne out by studies, they find that we're much more mixed up than that, and anyway, you know, the, 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 this kind of idea of, of Celtic cultures, a lot of historians now believe that Celtic was just a kind of lingua franca that people around um, the coastal areas of of Northern Europe used to, to trade goods. Yeah. Well, um, on that, you know, you, you look at, going back to what you were saying, there was another point was um, it being intermingled. You know, if you look at the, is it the head of my fathers, his great grandfather, or something was the head of the old IRA or something of that fact, it was the old IRA. <laughs> so when you talk about getting intertwined, when, when you look at Terry Wogan, when you look at um, the fella that does that interview show that grew up in, um, in Cork. Josh Boston, who are you from? Um, oh, uh, Marvin Gibson always talks about him and how he got, got abused from his Instagram <laughs> broad. He, he has roots in the Hawkeye. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Graham Norton. Graham Norton, yeah. yeah. And, and, and vice versa, and how some of the top dogs in our team now did their time in the BBC. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, the Sinn Fein, or sorry, SDLP, MLA, was just in Downing Street. You know, that, that's why intermingling doesn't happen with France or Germany. No. So this idea that, and this and idea, it's an economic thing as well. It's an economic reality, um, necessity. Yeah, whether it's you know, you're talking about sales to and from Ireland, the island of yeah. Ireland, and, and GB, or whether you're talking about goods come across Great Britain to, to get to Ireland, mm -hmm. the majority of, of goods that come into Ireland at some point go across Britain, so, you know, we're, we're far more connected than some people would like to, to think. Yeah, the, the big, like, my, my, my son is Spencer, that's pretty obviously English, he's done with Spencer, so my dad um, was born in Korea. Terry, do you want to go tell him what they were doing here? No. You ever did an interview here? See you. I'm not gonna come out till Wednesday. Okay. Right. Gonna... See. You. I'm not even gonna add that out. Yeah. Wrong. All right. It's yeah. possible. Okay.
See you then. Um, what was I saying? We're talking about interconnectedness, weren't we? Some, something around that. Yeah. Um, would you would you go so far then as to support a, a campaign to reintegrate the twenty six counties into sort of a, a greater British Isles, you know, a federation of the <coughs> of the Isles? I love the good man when he ran. He always seems to be the spearhead of that campaign. Yeah. Of very sort of embryonic campaign. It's got a bit to go. Yeah. But you can see the logic of it. I don't know, there's been too much in this last hundred years of cultivating a, a, a real, as come back to your point, antipathy mm -hmm. and aversion and just complete hard. You talk about hard Brexit, let's talk about the, the, the hard cultural, in, 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 in spite of the very clear cultural, historical, trade, health, everything mm -hmm. links, there's this um, mental block that has to have a hard break between the two. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't honestly think that it's realistic, but it's a good talking point. And, you know, yeah. you can argue a good case for why not, um, if, if it accepts that there would be no appetite for it. Yeah, well, the thing is, you know, there's constantly these panels um, of the one unionist and one of, like, talking about the inevitability of a United Ireland, I think. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how you can kind of tackle it that's more defence, but you, you've got to come up with something and you've got to start inviting these Republicans and Nationalists onto these panels talking about the, the future of the Union. Yeah. Which which ties in, I suppose, I've actually I've written a Dominic and um, we've come with come on to that. You wrote the um, in a recent article in the newsletter. Unionism needs to set out a core set of guiding principles to tell a positive story about what we want. Yeah. Well I know a lot of people mock this because sort of said, and I suppose justifiably so, well, you've got a hundred years to set out your principles, why are you wanting to do it now? I can see that argument, but, you know, we, we spend, uh, part of the problem is just the nature of unionism, and that what we want, we kind of have, and it's much more difficult to argue a compelling case for that than, than change. Um, you know, every, every political party wants to use the slogan, vote for change, even when it was the Conservative Party yeah. a few years ago, which is supposed to be about conserving things and institutions yeah. as they are, they still use the, the tagline, vote for change, and that makes a, a kind of, it's a compelling slogan, and we want to keep what we have, but I just want to get unionism away from always, and I, I, I'm so guilty of it myself, but we're always talking about what we're what we're against, what we're, uh, you know, we're, we're very often it's because we're reacting to it. Yeah. And I just thought it would be good if you could tie people together around um, some basic principles that generally they would they would all agree with, or at least thinking about those principles, what they might be. Yeah. Well, I, I was politically like uneducated. I didn't give it. I didn't. I didn't give a crap about it. Really, until I was like, actually, now is a good time to tell. It's a good thing to tell this. The, the, fir the first time I actually like woke up and started to try and think, what the heck's going on here? Was in 2009. I was in Toulouse, and guys living with from on that, on that side, you know, just say the west of Ireland. We also lived with a German guy. I said to him, I said that my Irish friend, best of pals, we live in the south. I didn't care. We're both Irish. I go to him, Jesus, it's the other day, you know, they go in the trenches shooting your ass. That was the name of the German guy. And my yes. Irish friend turns around to me and he said, Nah, Dad, I can shoot you, you bread bastard. And he said it in jest, yeah. in Bavaria, but that shook me to my core. And I was like, What the? So I just want to say, ever since then, I you shouldn't be so sure about that either. He could have been in the, the 16th Irish. Well, of course, yeah, 150,000 were. In, in, over in Flanders, where how many were in Easter Sunday, like 1500? Yeah, tiny, tiny unrepresentative. So right. odds are. But um, so the reason I'm saying that is because then I then began this journey of self education, and I was then 2013 14 became very much, I was a very much a civic unionist, mm -hmm. um, very culturally open, broad minded, and I was saying everything you were saying, and I remember. 
my computer option is Adobe and I'm clear with uh, DEP and I'm clear with Dirnet. But what I've since learned is that the high ups in the DEP, they all know exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. They just can't implement it. Like Peter Robinson, if you listen to his speeches, you can see that after office and then to see some of the things he was trying to do, what Simon Hamilton said. Yeah. But it's the, the said Alex came in there every year, you said it, but there's no one's actually doing it. Yeah. Am I right? Am I, am I right? Well, you, you're, you're, up, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and it was, was it Robinson who tried to convene a unionist forum um, with the idea of kind of talking through some of these issues? And where that got where that got into problems is I suppose it was kind of assumed that it was working towards forming one unionist party and then you get into issues around that because what, what then is the basis of that party and what, what kind of, um, is, is it going to be moderate, is it going to be hard line? I'm not, I don't think, because that was in response to the flag protest so I think that was actually taking a back step and was more about trying to consolidate because of the situation, if you look before that we were talking about he kept pushing Northern Irish identity. He, um, he 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 was talking about how the education system was was an apartheid system. Yeah, he did. And I'm I'm more talking about since he's left office, some of the things he said that suggest the man is very astute, but it's just the wild fray and the edges of, of unionism just so unruly that you can't stray too too centrist, or you'll be punished. Well, for, first of all. The DUP, it, it would be stupid to say that the DUP hasn't changed over the years because it definitely has. And it's become a more um, moderate party in, the, in a way than it was back in the day. It was back in the, the Sir Gordon Paisley night uh, times and everything else, of course, it has. Um, there's you know, a couple of aspects to that. There was the Good Friday Agreement, the kind of influx of um, unionists from the Ulster Unionist Party who didn't. Uh, buy into the agreement and then there's just a more kind of organic thing that if you're a unionist now if you're a young unionist and you want a job in politics or you want to get on in politics you maybe would join the DUP because you'd see them as a better bet yeah. than if, if that's I, I mean I, I'm not saying I, I'm just saying if, if that's the kind of uh, employment that you are seeking if you are that way minded if that's the kind of thing that you want to get into well you, know, you could go to the Australians, you could go to the conservatives like i did yeah. um, for a spell or you could join the dup and possibly there'll be a, a route for advancement there because you might get elected you might yeah. get a, a position as a researcher or something like that because they're the, the biggest party so that kind of moderation has um, been an organic thing but it's been held back because there's always been that older, um, harder line part of the party. And there's never really been quite a, they, they've never really quite wanted to split away from that. So you now yeah. have a party where there are, moderate, there are certainly moderate elements and people like Simon Hamilton. Yeah. Um, he's, he's moved on now, but he was, one of those. It's funny that he listened to this briefing and on behalf of that city council urging yeah. them to like get the bars open, open up the bars. So well, you know <laughs> what? I mean that that was it, it, it seemed to me an unusual thing because that's I'm just checking it's still working. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Um that's where we've been over the past uh little while. We, we, we've had um We've had the more liberal parties urging us to keep the bars closed. We've had the yeah. DUP, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sammy Wilson, Gregory Campbell, the rest of them wanting to get it back open again. Yeah. Get Gregory back Campbell's open. asking for them to be open. You know what? Don't don't quote me on yeah. that. I could have uh, I could have uh, I could have libeled them. Then. About what? Keep you keep talking. Just help them know the the generator here is is very broken. All right, we've got a we've got a technical Do problem. You know what? I, I, I remember what I was trying to say there before our, the colleague from my stairs came up. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm manning this shit badly there. Because I, I want to talk about, after I mention this, I want to ask you then about, talk about the true character of, of a mo we're talking, we're getting into political unionism and, and like the political mm -hmm. parties, but talk about what a, a unionism that you know, as in general, focus on 
and then in contrast with the stereotype. Need to put my thing on. I just say I think what I was trying to say earlier. Because this is something I really want to get into. Um, so I just want to put it on record. Um, you know, when you when, when we're talking about hard, when we're talking about a hard Brexit, when we're talking about um, this hard mental border in, in the minds of the Irish and the British. If we, if we look a hundred years ago, and we're approaching the centenary of Northern Ireland, which we'll talk about later, and what is going to be happening, what is going to happen if anything, mm -hmm. we we have had partition this island. I think unionists celebrate that. They, they, they didn't necessarily want partition. No, no, they well, not at, not at the time. There, it wasn't their ideal um, outcome. I mean, it was coming for a few years yeah. before, before it happened, but the ideal outcome was still for the time. Yeah, okay. and you know, the, the whole thing was you know, ro ro Rome, ro Rome rule is Rome rule, and even Mary Lee McDonald said, "You, you, you guys are right." Yeah, sorry, right point. Point. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so for my whole, my and it was a rural agrarian, was anti-industrial, very much mm -hmm. about tariffs, complete hard border, and I, that, that's that's what I want to say is that when you look at Devil Lairs Ireland, it wasn't a landslide. Technically, by the first past the post, this nineteen eighteen election was a landslide victory where they won the majority of the seats apart from in the north. But if you actually look at the numbers, they only won like forty eight percent of the vote. Yeah. And um, yeah, okay, some constituencies at the time it wasn't amazing, but still still only forty eight. And with that forty eight percent, which now you would need to come that's forty eight so that's that's not fifty percent. Yeah. It's not even fifty percent plus one. You, you know, what what about the soft what about the soft border, what about the soft break, what about the, the weeks in the and what about having this all party executive? It was hardly a resounding mandate for the kind of really radical outcome that they wanted. Which and the, the radical outcome was just plowing through with the hardest of hard borders and just erecting borders. It was more. I mean, I, 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 would I be wrong in, in drawing a parallel to maybe um, what was happening in Russia in nineteen seventeen? Well, um, where a kind of a, a vanguard. Yeah pushed an extreme political outcome mm. um, on the majority of people who would probably have preferred something more moderate. Yeah, absolutely. Like the Irish Parliamentary Party in that election got like something like 20, 30 percent of the vote. Um, you know, shouldn't this kind of threats, intimidation and rigging and so on and so forth. But um, it's, it's just incredible this day and age when, when nationalists are at the forefront and they say you have a soft Brexit cancelling Brexit, having complimentary vote, muddying the waters, weakening it, that uh, it's these same people who are, are embraced full heartedly their history, which was of completely discrediting and discounting their, their political opponents. You know, Del Lair said, you know, unions are a boulder in the road which must be um, exterminated, or not exterminated, and just swept, swept, swept out of the way, talking about um, them, them being in, in an alien culture and from the pull back to yeah. Britain more or less. Yeah. So um, that is at the root for me of this Ireland we're now living in, which is one that is oil, like oil and water, and where there can be no intermingling. There has to be complete jealous sovereignty and separation between the two, the two, yeah, two well, islands. That's, I, I, I don't know, and, and you're sort of in the meeting, we might get into the centenary debate later, but. Um, from my perspective, it's interesting to just see the vehement reaction from nationalism without any ideas of celebrating the centenary yeah. and, and this uh, kind of almost original sin of partition, as they say. Yeah. But partition didn't come out of nowhere. It came yeah. out of a, a very turbulent period of Irish history. It came after the 1916 um, rebellion. It came after the Anglo-Irish War. And if unionists at any point were even tempted by some sort of all Ireland, uh, all Ireland home rule um, arrangement by the end of that period, they certainly weren't. So, you know, should we not be taking that into consideration a little bit at the time? Actually, um, you know, if partition hadn't happened, where would, where would we have yeah. been? Because we might have been in a much more widespread kind of civil war situation, which not not just like the Irish civil war, which was kind of obviously awful enough, but yeah. something that engulfed the entire 
Island and pitched unionists against nationalists yeah. and, and potentially even bringing um, you know, the troops from, from the mainland into it and it could have been a much more serious situation. So. Absolutely. Well, if, if, if you look at um, I, I, <coughs> this journey I've been on, as I said, where I'm trying to work out all you Brit, this this Brit bastard is actually Irish mm -hmm. and is legitimately Irish. You know, I found out a couple of years after that that you know my great grandparents, at least two of them, signed the Ulster Covenant. When you look at that pledge that half a million was it half a million men and women signed to resist home rule, is to resist home rule. So the resisting home rule, half a million, and then suddenly you think, no, no, we're, we're going to do one better. We're going to make it a republic. You think there's half a million people just going like, okay, yeah, sure. Where, where was there lately a, a sort of a furore about somebody describing unionists as planters online on Twitter? Okay, I can't remember. There was a whole um, there was a whole argument about that. The, the women, the way that Twitter runs, yeah, break out. But imagine describing people, you, you, you and me. Um, other people who've been here since the 16th, 17th centuries as kind of interlopers, as newcomers, as, as people who should, who shouldn't see this as their home, who should maybe move back to, yeah. to, to where they came from. And, you know, you're talking 400 years anyway. Nationalist Republicans, they've largely banished that to the fringes, because J.I. Adams in the 80s talked about repat repatriation grants. Um, but I think, honestly, I think that it's, it's, it could be more commonplace than, than it's... Uh, but it comes out in that language, planter. Yeah. If you look at Phil Flanagan, is it Phil Flanagan? That's your main guy. Emily has just disappeared off, off the place. place yeah, he was no longer here, but... Yeah. yeah, he would talk about, like, you know, oh, you're just hate immigrants, but don't mind them. They're, they're, they didn't mind them when they were coming over here. It's, it, I think it is more commonplace than you would like to see, but... It, it, I was reading commentary on De Valera, suggestion that um, unionists repatriated themselves back in Britain, and you said that in the 20s or whatever. And I think a, a high up US diplomat said, like, you know, as this is likely as Americans in Massachusetts going back to England, you know, <laughs> yeah. this is wh why is that in no other world is, is that, you know, what other, other, other people in Georgia and Kentucky? in West Virginia, a lot of people are of Scots and Irish, but should they come back to Scot come back to Ulster or and then do they go back to Scotland? Because so so it's it but for some reason in this one way world of Irish pol political debate that isn't okay. You get into you get into problems when you start to discuss who's been here first and um you know, I, I know there are issues around immigration and everything else, and there's, there's a debate to be had about that, but once you go back much further than that, and you start to say, oh, well, you were only here in 1600, I was here in 1100, and, yeah. and all of that kind of thing, and, or, or you know, people claiming that they've been there from, from the very start, that their ancestors have been there from the very start, you're in a very dubious ground, yeah. whatever kind of political, um, proposition you're making whatever country you're, you're talking about. Yeah, that's why I take a lot of comfort in, because I, I remember as, even as a child, I was aware of that, you hear Brits spit out and stuff. So, but I, I take a lot of comfort in the words of John Hewitt, you know, he talks about, you know, um, he talks about, you know, my, 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 my grandfather's, his white bones line, the earth or something to that effect, you know, they're, they're, part, they're part of the pasture and, and, and the hedgerows and they're just, they're, he's, all of the men in the earth. Yeah. So he is of this earth, he is from here. Um, so I, 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 I think that needs to be pushed back against very strongly. It's, it's just a, it's very regretful, it's so commonplace. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but well, um, so I was saying, I just want to ask you very quickly about um, your sense of, let's forget about Peter Robinson, great chat, um, parties, and Campbell, Jim Gregory Campbell. You, you're very into Northern Ireland football. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk too much about football because I'm not really into it. Yeah. Just because I know you're a rugby man. Um, rugby man. I'm so into Irish rugby. Keith Woods, my hero. But um, <laughs> he's from Clare. But um, 
want to talk more about look, there's a caricature of what a unionist is, you know, the flute, the sash, the bowler hat, so on and so forth. But you know, me and you, you're pro union unionists. Can you maybe talk to me about what your sense of just a regular Northern Irish unionist do this? Yeah, because I, I think I was saying to you earlier that um, I always thought of myself very much as a moderate union at least, to describe myself as a liberal unionist. Yeah, I seem to be pigeonholed in, in later years as somebody who's a bit more hardline than that. But I, I, I've never had a, I, I'm, I'm glad that it's there. And I mean, I've, I've got, relatives if you go back a few generations who were involved in it, but I've, I've never really had any int interest in the Orange Order. Um, I'm not particularly religious either, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that I have a faith, I don't go to church, I'm not, um, you know, from that kind of cliché background yeah. either, not, not that I'm saying that there's anything wrong with that, um, but my family do you have that background, but I, but I wouldn't have that background. My interest in unionism comes from um, my political allegiance to the rest of the UK, and the fact that I want to be part of that, the fact that I want to be part of the national debates, the fact that I want to play a part in the national culture of the United yeah. Kingdom, um, and the fact that I want Northern Ireland to be more mainstream, um, in terms of that, and to play a bigger part in that. Yeah. And um, that's where my politics come from. And I know that that's not maybe typical either. Uh, I know that that's, that maybe it's a minority of unionists who have that kind of sense of, um, of, of, re of really wanting to push the national picture rather than the local picture. Yeah. But that's, that's what animates me for whatever reason. I know, but when I'm when I'm talking, so you grew, you grew up around Ballymena, yeah. Town. I'm talking more about, you know, you 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 well, it says correctly, you're a nipple. You're, you're one of these nipples. Accurate, have you heard of that? I'm a what? Northern <laughs> Ireland, Northern Ireland Protestant professional living in England and Scotland. This great because the the annual oh, exodus okay. of grammar school or high school educated, not only Protestant unions. You go 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 abroad, and um, some of who, some of whom come home. I yourself, not a huge number. One of my friends came back after Newcastle, Dubai. Now he's moved over to Hungary to meet his wife. I think that that's who I'm talking about. These characters who I grew up with. We played football in the Amens. We did skateboarding. We played Nintendo sixty four. We drank at the corner. We went to a youth club. We went to a Baptist youth club. We supported Northern Ireland. We were flipping in. obsessed with Irish rugby. We didn't have a thought. We didn't have the foggiest about um, politics. Mm -hmm. We went to the twelfth. We didn't have any antipathy towards the twelfth. The marchers. We didn't see any any majorly wrong with. We went to the bonfires. There was some ugliness to it, but we were overly robust by it. We had no antipathy towards the south. We 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 speaking of myself and my peers. Like my friend from the south. He was Irish, he just happened to live across the border. I didn't know why the border was there, it was just there. Um, so I think that stands in stark contrast to this, the, the Southerners especially, who don't even have a notion of, of what a unionist is, apart from like grotesque caricature. I yeah. mean, there's not that many of us. Yeah, you're seen as some kind of um, exotic species almost, and, and, and this idea of the kind of bowler hatted. Yeah. Um, or had an old guy kind of ramping and raving and, and, um, and clasped in the Bible in one hand and his, his older hat in the other. I think when I, when I was real, I still do go real against loyalism, the, the, the excesses of loyalism and unionism, but I remember um, when I was deeper into that, um, when, 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 they were, when, when they weren't exactly covering themselves in glory, um, I remember pointing out that like, it's like 7% of the, it's like, 15, 7, it's either between 7 and 15 percent of the Protestant Unionist population is actually in either a band or the Orange Order. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that the, the, the perception is that 100 percent more are, are you know, Paisley type church going yeah. creators, but yet only it's 85 percent of that aren't even there. 
85% or yeah. more like Roy McIlroy or Val Morrison or George Best, just chilled out dudes who have a pint at the weekend. Yeah, there's that much more, um, I, I don't know whether you want to call it the secular mm. culture or, or whatever it is. And actually, where I think that there's a danger, particularly at the moment, because I mean, this is one of the things where I've been writing out about is that that um, contingent of people become completely estranged from politics because they begin yeah. to see it as Absolutely. something that's um, that's you know inimical to how they see themselves because it, it's too aggressive, it's too confrontational. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I do have, I do have worries about that because I think that that not only is that section, as you say, it's maybe eighty five percent. I don't, I don't know whether it's got to that point yet, but it's certainly getting getting bigger. Yeah. And um, you know, if you, I don't want to bring it back to the unionist parties because you, you know, don't want to more kind of cultural look at things, but if the unionist parties want to have a hopeful future and want to uh, and want to strengthen the union they have to engage with that 85 mm. percent however they want however they're going to do that by either moving themselves or by another party you know merging or whatever yeah well that's the you, the standard line is that all unionism is doing not to to to, to, sh to show the benefits of the union to, to the to the nationalist sort of demographic yeah. but that, that's it yeah. uh, yeah, actually the Almost as big a problem is the sort of sort of just habitually, or what's the word, just the sort of like thinking casual union, pro union dude who isn't political at all. They're lo they're 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 going to lose them if they don't go more not um, secular, but just chilled out. Yeah, and there's also I mean I, you're never supposed to blame whatever you do. I also think that sometimes we take for granted what we have here. Um, is this getting into Trevor Rimmon territory here? I, and, uh, I don't know that, that I am, though. I mean, I, was, uh, you know, I always respect what Trevor's, what, what Trevor's saying. I, I don't mean that we're... I don't necessarily mean that we, we don't appreciate that we've got or whatever. I mean that, that we don't appreciate just that we've got um, a good standard of living. Yeah. But for the most part, I know not everybody does. Yeah. Um, we've got quite a good place to live in terms of sort of transport links and, and yeah. all of all the rest of it. And that that largely depends upon us remaining in the union. And if you kind of think uh, of Brexit where understandably there were a lot of people kind of cheesed off of that because they voted Remain and they yeah. don't kind of see their um, they see it as cutting against what Northern Ireland did yeah, yeah. and everything else. But if you throw the baby out with the bathwater and then sort of decide that you're then going to entertain maybe uh, the Republic um, spreading out Having a, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to say United Ireland without using the word United Ireland because I, I reject that yeah. that term. I suppose Northern Ireland being absorbed by the Republic of Ireland, um, that's not going to solve any of the problems that you've got with with Brexit. Yes, yeah. it's, it's only going to make things worse because it's going to make the economic situation worse. It's going to make um, division worse. It's possibly going to result in. Uh, civil unrest. So, I, I I think that people people who are sort of drawn down that way because they're so pissed off at the way that things are going, they do as well need to look at the broader picture of what we have yeah. and what we value and why that's important. Yeah, I think it's very yeah it's very very disingenuous sometimes. Um, some of the conversation to talk about Brexit as making a United Ireland inevitable as though before Brexit. They weren't saying that. No. At every turn, every, every year, every conference. For as long as I can remember, that's been the, the allegation. Yeah, to me, Brexit like hasn't made it any more urgent. You know, there was a hard border. If you want to get into it, there was a hard border with the currency. There was a hard border with 
tax, VAT, etc., etc. And when things when things come down the road, I don't think there's going to be a huge change unless you're a truck driver or unless you're a big business owner. So it, it really is quite disingenuous and um, the hysteria. And I always just turn to Ed Maloney. Did he even write it down? I actually wrote it down because I want to talk about this. You know, he talks. He said three or four times in his meeting, I was going to have to do it. I quote, good Ed Maloney, one of my favorite writers, if you really want to respect you. The Republican group can read his blog, The Broken Elbow. Um, he says, the Good Friday Agreement says nothing nada about the nature of the border, hard, soft, or middling, and all those politicians from Barad Group to Mary Lou have either been pulling wool over our eyes while themselves feel they can to complete the simplest of due diligence. And that's from a man who would be pretty soft, moderate nationalist. Yeah. Um, well, that's right, because all of the all, all of the claims that the Good Friday Agreement's got something to do with the European Union are based on its, supposedly its subtext or things that are, um, they're not explicitly in the text. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's again where I think unionism has got things wrong over the years because it hasn't owned the Good Friday Agreement and used it to um, advance its yeah. aims. It's instead left that to nationalism and as a result we've had all this kind of all the claims of implicit content in, in the Good Friday Agreement. And if, if the Good Friday Agreement contained all the things that people said it did, it would be, you know, a yard yeah, yeah. thick. But what the, the 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 explicit content, the stuff, the stuff that, that that's actually in there, it's all based on the principle of consent and it's the friend of unionists if they want to use it that way. Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah, that, that's where people are trying to muddy the waters. Northern Ireland is a constituent part, a core part of the United Kingdom, and yeah. only so until fifty percent plus one say so. And as current as it currently stands, that 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 is the case. The majority want it to be so. And this idea that you know, it was peddled right at the start that oh, modern unionists now want a republic because of Brexit and the way like Jim Dornan, you know, he's a great great guy, the Jim Dornan's dad. And, they would have done with me if, if a few years ago, you know, these because it's it suits their agenda. These guys, and Jimmy Nesbitt or whatever, who, who suddenly are all pro pro United Ireland. But I'm pretty sure it's a Pete Sherlock or someone of that nature, um, showed that actually <coughs> recent polling shown has completely deranged the idea that you know a unionist is a unionist, and you know Brexit in terms of what is this changes of a Brexit is nothing compared to what a United Ireland would mean. And you know no. when you talk, when you put on the table right we're changing to, to Euros and health service is going to change presumably that's a whole different beast. And yeah. And again that's something that I find very um disingenuous, this whole Brexit debate that for some reason you know whenever it comes to London austerity and funding and not funding um, austerity is bad, funding isn't enough. But then when we look at Brussels and the austerity that comes from there, the protectionism that comes from there, the rules and regulations over um, state aid, minimum standards and minimum wage, so on and so forth, there seems to be no critical facility or any sort of critical thought that Europe is only a good thing, it can be no bad. And Britain, London can only be can only be a bad thing. It's only natural that we're gonna distance from ourselves from them and go closer ever ever closer with Europe. Sort of slightly ironic because um, it's become not about the detail of things like that. It's become more something about identity. What you want to say about yourself, and if you want to be uh, seen as kind of progressive and liberal and whatever else, now you identify yourself with the European Union, which is a strange institution to identify yourself with because whether you think it's a good thing or not, it's impersonal, it's, it's almost designed to put distance between people and uh, the decision makers. I mean, that's what it's there for. The, 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 the Commission, the, the European Council, all of the sort of key European institutions 
are not elected. Yeah. Um, so uh, the thing that kind of uh, it, it's it's going back exactly to what to what you said. Um, if if you voted remain because you wanted things to 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 stay pretty much as they were, you didn't want disruption to the economy. Um, you didn't want to bring in a lot of variables uh, about the future. Why then would you support um, a change in our constitutional status, which yeah. is going to create? Ten times as much disruption, yeah. ten times as much uncertainty, yeah. and, uh, and and ten times um, as many problems for the economy. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So it's the damage to this and It's it's, just it's not a it, it, yes. It's it's not a serious argument. Yeah. I don't think. Um, I understand that it's what it has done is it's kind of made um, a section of modern nationalism. Yeah. Kind of double down yeah. on. What they want uh, right now, as a, a, you know, as opposed to what they were prepared to park as a kind of distant aspiration. Yeah. Well, the, the, the other thing um, I find quite interesting. I used to be a big fan of Chris Hitchens, and not overly religious, but I have a, a small faith. Um, he, his, some of his commentary in Northern Ireland was very good. Um, he was based here with like a lot of journal, you know, a lot of veteran journalists, journal. retiring journalists, you know, like Jeremy Parkman. Mm -hmm. They all started off here in the early twenties, doing yeah. doing doing the beat. He was here, and he says, you know, the nineteen seventy three entry into the European com community, as it was then, by Britain and Ireland at the same time, effectively, it did, obviously, it didn't win the border checkpoints because of the violence, but it effectively, with all the, I don't, well, because it was a European economic community, it effectively took away the customs posts, so it didn't take away the the. Uh, Security installations, I suppose. Yeah, so for all intents and purposes, it eradicated the border. So, and it became, well, it became a united Arab island economically, not, not entirely in, in a sense. So, again, it just reiterates my point that um, the, this all is talk about the urgency of, of, a, of a united Ireland post Brexit. I'm not stupid, I remember exactly the debate before Brexit. And it was all it was always the same same argument, so it doesn't matter if yeah, we have the the this invisible border still yeah. screaming at the rooftops, you need the United 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 Ireland. If there is an invisible border, you need the United Ireland. It just has to be all one way traffic club. Yeah. It's seen as a an opportunity to intensify things and maybe to get it over the line. Mm -hmm. But uh, that that inclination to think that that's inevitable has never changed in Irish nationalism and it never will change. It's seen as an inevitability. But you know, I I uh, <laughs> like to go back to my uh, pauper and uh, uh, put the poverty of historicism um, and and his idea that. Uh, yeah, the idea of kind of historical inevitability is just a nonsense. Yeah, that's something troubling at the moment. Just this idea of being on the right side of history, and if people look at the past and see certain things that have happened with civil rights movements, and think that they're part of the civil rights movement now, means that it's it's right, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that that is so. Um, but you can also couch things in, in different types of language, and one of the ways that you can do that is to style. Political demand, or you know, an attempt to win a political entitlement as a right, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's any more defensible or any more sacrosanct. If you look at it properly, it's just because you call it a right doesn't necessarily mean it's a right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and before we go on to like uh, the centenary stuff, it's just it, it is interesting you know, with with Europe. You know, there's such an appetite and readiness, and so on talk about the great eagles and iniquities that come out of Whitehall, mm -hmm. but no looking at Michelle Barnier, you know, you know, Gert Hush, these are just great upstanding men. The people that say it, they probably don't know uh, uh, a modicum about their actual policies and their thoughts and their history. It, it's a really weird phenomenon because I don't think that if you'd gone back five years, say to, to 2015 before the, before the referendum, 
that anybody would have um, stood there and defended these kind of faceless institutions and the people who run them and, and kind of acted like that, acted not only like they were a good thing and a stabilizing thing and something that you know were necessary but imperfect, but actually identified with them. And yet that's happening. Now. Yeah. So that's that's one of the weirder aspects of Brexit. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Do you want to talk a wee, wee bit about this? I, I don't. I haven't thought of this clue, and I think maybe there has been a bit of distraction politics going on about what this RC border and what's going to happen, and what that means to you, and why why you're worried about it. Yeah, I'm. I'm worried about the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, just simply because. The, the details all there in the document, <coughs> and um, you know, but Boris Johnson and, Ma and Michael Gove has, have told us that there will be an RC border, and uh, you know they've given these sort of promises about filling in forms and this kind of thing. So nobody wants to do it, and then you know gra gradually you see all that swept away, and you see these things beginning to emerge as we come to the end of the year. I think that there will be. There'll certainly be checks. There'll certainly be um, all the, the kind of psychosanitary, uh, agricultural uh, the, the checks and animals and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing will be um, stricter. And I mean, you you hear that uh, you hear people saying all this stuff is in, is in place already and takes place already, and it does to an extent. But you're talking about um, much more extensive uh, checks for the EU. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're talking about checks on foodstuffs as well as just simply live animals. Yeah. Um, manufacturers, when they big bring in goods to process, the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol says that goods for processing will incur duty, so they're going to have to pay tariffs on the goods. Are. So on the goods. Market, okay. you're talking about? Uh, yeah, uh, goods coming from GB to NI, um, if they're for processing, up front they'll attract the tariff and then the companies will um, gain those tariffs back if they uh, if they um, stay if they stay in the land. Now again the, 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 there's um, a joint body set up between the UK and the EU and they can sort of uh, they, they can exempt certain categories of goods from that requirement but they haven't done it yet and it's it's August and we've got um, and sort of maximum four months to get this sorted. So as it stands, uh, if you're a company that's bringing in anything to be turned into something, you're going to have to pay a tariff on that and then try and claim that money back. And you know, who, who's talking about that? Yeah. Uh, I, I think <clears throat> the thing that will bring it home to people most is if they go onto Amazon and try and buy um, right. It's not not from Amazon itself, but from one of the Amazon traders, because these these traders are small. Yeah. Generally, maybe just a guy or you know a couple of people working out of their house, whatever. And they're they're, they're going to be confronted with paperwork to send goods to Northern Ireland, yeah. and they're not going to bother yeah. because it's not going to be worthwhile. Okay. Um. So you're going to start to try and order. A, Book or whatever off Amazon and find the wheels, and then there's going to be yeah, they will send it to you. Okay. Um, there's massive worries about uh, goods coming over for supermarkets. But arguably, so but these this, this doesn't sound good, and maybe takes away from some of the looseness I was saying earlier. But these this paperwork wasn't going from GB to Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. It would be going from Northern Ireland to the Republic. They were trying to sell. Yes. Yeah. So is that so the trend, so then Europe is just saying they've just said you know there's going to be no internal. Or there's going to be yeah. Well, when we've come down to this through the negotiation, but I mean we can trace it back to the very. It's just not getting into my head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, at, at the very. Uh, I don't know whether you remember at the very. Um, just after the referendum, we started to hear this idea of a special status yeah. for Northern Ireland that basically meant that we would stay in the EU mm -hmm. while the rest of, of the United Kingdom would leave. Okay. Um, from that idea, it's, it's sort of come through various iterations, but there's always been 
a lobby that's been saying if you're going to have any barriers it has to be down the Irish Sea rather than uh, within Ireland because we won't accept any infrastructure, yeah. not even a camera, yeah. we will accept nothing. Yeah. And there's been a capitulation to that. Yeah. Well, I think it was Liam, Liam Beckett, uh, sorry, here's a, here's a cut, the, the sort of like passive observer, Liam Beckett did a good tweet and said to hell with any Boyle customs officer that stops me when I'm driving, when I'm getting the boat over to Scotland. So, yeah. well, look, I, I don't think anybody's talking about um, people stopping, yeah. you, stopping you if you're trying to get the ferry or whatever. You're talking about this, I mean, most of this will affect businesses, yeah. but it's when you, uh, not many of us are exporting goods yeah. across the IRC or it, more more relevantly really importing them because that's where uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland is where the problems are going to lie really. Um, but we're all consumers and we're all going to the supermarket and if things go up in price, if things aren't available or some of the uh, national supermarkets decide that they're going to up and take their business elsewhere, which has been <coughs> yeah. talked about quite seriously, then we will start to notice the difference. And then, you know, th maybe at that point, we'll start to think this was a pretty important topic. Maybe we should have been discussing it more thoroughly. Yeah, did you vote to leave or stay? I voted to leave in the end, but I had a very um, hard think about that. And I mean, I, I did know <coughs> that there would be problems. I, I suppose it came down to two things. It came down to um, the idea of voters being in charge of what was yeah. going to happen to their country, the whole kind of sovereignty debate. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm quite interested in Eastern Europe and, and, uh, and Russia and that kind of thing too. And I saw the EU kind of encroaching um, in ways that made Europe more unstable and, and less, uh, and less peaceful and I don't think particularly in, in Ukraine where they, they sort of supported a, a movement that was pro-European but wasn't actually uh, representative of the majority of people in Ukraine, at least that hadn't been tested. Yeah. But because those were our guys yeah. and um, the people who maybe saw the country's future as being in a different direction were pro-Russian. although. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we support our guys and, and ensure that they get their, uh, uh, get control over the country. So, you know, I, I saw things like that as incredibly dangerous. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, that's where the anti-imperial thing comes in. So, again, this is where I find this sort of being disingenuous. These people normally so so true to posterity and being necessary. Or when it comes to from Brussels, I'm not even sure that's just what, it is, what it is, what it is. And Markov, who Markov was so on so forth, who, who instituted that and oversaw it, and it's admitted now that it's far worse than it had to be. No, no issue, great world. Um, empire, absolutely diabolical, the British, worst place in the world. European Empire, which has been Fine. explicitly put on record by Guy Verhofstadt, working towards the European army. Not, not a word, no, no comment, amazing, bring it on, no issues. Yeah. So this idea, again, yeah, um, I voted for me, but this sort of fawning reverence for people who have no idea who they are, um, is, is, it's, it, it's, it, it would make you go back and change it to, to, to vote leave. You would just look at Tusk, Donald Tusk, talking about, you know, special place in hell for anyone who voted Brexit and this self-righteous this about, um, against the little Englanders, but yet what's going on in his backyard in Poland, the extreme nationalism, the right wing government, the anti-abortion, anti-women's rights, so on and so forth. Um, well, the idea of ever closer union was explicitly written into the European project and mm -hmm. never been taken out. You can sort of say, well, the UK added, acted as a check to that, mm -hmm. but it, it couldn't always, and it couldn't, um, couldn't guarantee that that, uh, that that kind of vision of, of, uh, of a European state would be kept on the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, so th there, so there, were very real, or there are very real intrinsic problems to the European project that people 
here as well had a right to discuss. And I know um, that now there's this kind of idea that because Northern Ireland voted to remain, that's a separate mandate from the rest of the United Kingdom. But you know, if, if, if our principle of consent means anything, then it means that we have a right to take part in a national vote on the same basis as everybody else, yeah. not as, yeah. as our own little place or in some, some kind of federal yeah. arrangement. We have a right to have our votes kind of just on the same, yeah. we have the same basis as everybody else and then we have a right to leave on the same yeah. um, basis. Well, that's the whole um, Good Friday Agreement. Northern Ireland is a core constituent part of the United Kingdom until we say so. It's not, mm. it's not joint government, it's not shared sovereignty. It is a sovereign constituent member of the United Kingdom. The Supreme Court ruled in this right at the start of, um, I think it was, uh, it's a guy, a, a loyalist guy whose son was killed by yeah, the yeah. who takes all these cases. Mm -hmm. And he took this case to, uh, all the way to the Supreme Court to say that um, we weren't allowed to, uh, the, the, the government weren't allowed to trigger, trigger article uh, Article 16 is the uh, to trigger Brexit basically yeah. until um, it, because Northern Ireland hadn't explicitly given us uh, it's okay, and this was sort of against the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. The Supreme Court came back with a judgment that made it absolutely crystal clear that the principle of consent covers only our place in the United Kingdom yeah. or whether we want to form part of an all Ireland state. Yes. Yeah. It's not, you know, you can't on pick it. That's yeah. what it is. And people could, you know, you could call that zero sum or whatever, but that's what it is. For, it's about the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, and talk, so we're, cons we're core constituent member of the United Kingdom. So talking about that, where it's nearly, it's going to be 100 years. There's no specific date. There's a couple of dates that could, could be pointed to as the birthday. Is it, uh, yeah. So how, how, how do you look for over these last hundred years and how are you looking at, to, at the centenary and how are you looking after, or after that? I know it's going to be a, an opportunity for some people to attack the idea of Northern Ireland as, as a place and, and to, to kind of promote partition and everything else. I mean, we sort of touched upon this earlier. I think that Northern Ireland's formation probably prevent it. it was probably the best answer at the time to the turmoil that was engulfing the island of Ireland. And it also it gave people like you and me um, a chance to be both British and Irish yeah. in a way that we wouldn't otherwise have had. Can I can I just interject when we think could try to contain what you're saying? This is you know, as I said, I've been doing a heck of a lot of reading and traveling and researching. You know, if you looked at what happened down south those men who returned wearing a British uniform were shamed and banished from the community. Uh, British statues, war memorials, were overseen by the parish priest were eradicated. More or less, it became a homogenous Republic in Ireland, even though, as I said, point out in that vote, it, it was anything but categorical, the, 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 the vote. Um, there, there is no unionist community in our side. There's no pro-union sentiment. No. Um, so you just have to have to look at that. Um, am I saying that what happened in Northern Ireland in the, the early days and the 50s, 60s was right? Absolutely not. But um, we didn't have a perfect place, but at least we had a place that um, was diverse, that didn't become monocultural, it didn't become mono-religious. Um, and you could say that was maybe because of the sort of size of the minority or whatever, yeah. but that, you know, that, that um, homogenous thing didn't happen in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And in the kind of earlier part of our history, we maintained kind of proud industrial heritage, we contributed in a, in a, in a very meaningful way to um, the Second World War yeah. and, and you know, Churchill, I think, made specific mention of uh, Northern Ireland's role and said that the war couldn't have been 
Well, we look yeah. at uh, our look like our competition as uh, has been Eisenhart. Did he? Yeah. I, I didn't know that, but there you go. These quotes should be on a big giant mural. Yeah, all the tourists and American and everyone to see. In all honesty, that's right. There should be there should be something to mark that in a kind of um, a permanent way for. Uh, um, maybe maybe there's a project for. Yeah, for twenty twenty one. Yeah, the, the, maybe the, you could paint the mural. Probably. Yeah, I've, I've, I think I've said it a few times that you know I think it's got a wall and uh, some scaffolding that'll do it happily. Um, I th- you know who's who's that um sort of rock star economist down the south? Um, yeah, like Williams. Yeah, David McWilliams exactly. You know he talked about in the forties, fifties, sixties. Amer- Northern Ireland was America, and the south was like Mexico with the crappy roads, the crappy infrastructure. And Northern Ireland was light years ahead. Um, and if, I hate this sounds really bigoted, but it's just it's brought up all the time. You know, the Protestants or unionists are bigots and nationalists are by right virtuous and forgiving, generous. But just look at I you know when, I, when I'm looking at the history of, of this island this last hundred years, I find it fascinating when we're talking about monoculture. If you, if you look at um, when you talk about sharing society and reconciliation. If you look about what the South had in terms of being schools governed by the Catholic Church, healthcare being governed by the Catholic Church, and um, reproduction, so on and so forth, and then even if you look at marriage, mm-hmm. um, given how close the Catholic Church was to the state, and given that the Catholic Church from Rome had issued the Nay to Mary decree, yep. that it more or less made it illegal for yes, Protestants to, to, to raise yeah, their children and their religion. But except for. for Mixed uh, marriage, except for Protestants to raise Protestants within Protestant, um, within the Protestants, but yeah. it couldn't be Protestant couldn't marry a Catholic and raise them as Protestant. Now imagine if that had to be. That wasn't a rule up here. That was a rule down south. So with with the community so attuned to the grievances and pointing out inequality and injustice, it's remarkable that that wasn't yeah. raised and you know, that should be looked at in terms of when we're talking about. Um, not only a culture that was hostile to even this culture, but yeah. in effect. Um, what's the word? What sort of you, you want to slow because only 10% of the population that's going to advocate it if it's in the league more, it's not de facto, but more or less illegal. Yeah. Okay. But that's not raised. So, so you talk away, I'm just going to fix it for him. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even even to look at the situation today, um, the, the kind of I think David McWilliams would say that there's a, an economic disparity um, between the Republic and Northern Ireland, but things aren't perfect for you know the, the people I talk to who live in the Republic of Ireland either. The maybe younger people who just can't get in the on the the, the property ladder certainly can't uh, afford even a flat in Dublin. I mean, I've got a, a very good friend who, who lives in Paris just for the reason that he, he can't afford to live in the Republic of Ireland. It's become economically inviable for him. And I mean, the, he, he saw the, the election, just the, the kind of depth of discontent there is there, you know, particularly among young people who've got problems with their, their health service like we do ourselves um, on occasions. But, you know, it, it's not, you're, you're not talking about some sort of Utopia as against somewhere that it's unpleasant to live because whenever they have surveys kind of get, uh, asking about life satisfaction, happiness, and things like that, they're always coming at it as pretty well. People are content enough here if they uh, if they're not kind of focused on the political aspects of it all the time. If they're just thinking about the the kind of lifestyle that they have, we've got a we've got a place that's pretty laid back, pretty well. Um, provision, you know, the, the, I, think, I think most people here, again, I'm not saying everybody, and it, maybe it's going to get different after um, this period of economic inactivity that we've had, because I think that's yeah. going to have a horrible mm-hmm. effect on everywhere that, that, that's locked down, but um, we, we, have a, we have a nice place to live. Yeah, that's that. Even it was Eamon McCann said, for everyone's obsession with the stereotype of the Protestant Unionist, he'd have him use the term Protestant. It, it is, it is the reality. Um, you, 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 you'd be culturally Protestant. 
Yeah, you know, not, you know, that. Yeah. necessarily. So I, no, I, but I would come from a Protestant background, yeah. and I mean, I was taken to a Presbyterian church as a yeah. child, and, and my, my parents still attend t- church and do have that kind yeah. of um, faith that I haven't followed through. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just sort of saying that, and that, like, I hate having to use that sort of faction, but that's just the reality of this divided society we've grown up, grown up in. Mm-hmm. These are labels we've been inherited. Um, but you know, Eamon McCann, one of my favorite pieces he wrote, was talking about real him, he himself, the nationalist, reeling against this idea of unionism being mo- monolithic, and this n- Northern Ireland's Alex Masky was saying this like, what would he say? This little horrible little cesspit of a press of a cafe is going to be stoned at every corner. Whereas you know, Northern Ireland, even in the sixties, was was very much like the swinging sixties of the UK, where, where there were atrocities and horrible things, absolutely. But by and large. The, the world that my parents knew was that of, of, of George Beth, Van Morrison. Um, I, I, I could go on. You gave a great overview. You have to give a shout for the Rolling Stones coming to the Flamingo Ballroom in Ballymena. Yeah, and the, 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 you know, for, for every bog side um, atrocity, and not to me, not at all, there, 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 was a, there was a great article that said for every little flashpoint and horror story there was communities that got on very well yeah so this idea of just demonizing northern ireland to an absolute shithole um it's just patently untrue but that is the story that is being told and they are telling now and our young people are are, are especially the catholic versus oh. republican communities seem to be embracing look at look at the way that this idea has become accepted that catholics didn't get the vote in northern ireland I mean, that's historically nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, where there was an issue, the franchise was reformed. In it was quite the rest of the United Kingdom. Kingdom. The, 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 the franchise, uh, the council franchise was reformed in the rest of the United Kingdom. And it didn't happen here, so there was a link between yeah. the property and council folks. So, just to be clear, in the general election, everyone could vote. Everyone got vote. Catholic, working class. In the storm, Assembly elect uh, the, the storm of the Northern Ireland Parliament elections, everybody got a vote. And in the council, council elections, elections yes. the majority of people, both Protestants and Catholics, got a vote. A small amount of Catholic, a uh, small number of Catholics, who weren't property owners, didn't get um, their say in council elections. Yeah, and, and that, that, that was that was wrong. That was wrong. Protestant unionists. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Didn't know property, didn't go to absolutely. Right. absolutely. I, I, I've encountered this myself where I said I was proud to come from Northern Ireland, I'm not saying who, but a friend or a friend of a friend saw that I said that and they were absolutely horrified. Oh, please didn't get the vote. It, it, it was something that affected like how, yeah. how, how Eric Bader was accosted in the streets of Belfast every time he came in. And, um, so, and this is fr- from a very middle class, well, and a person in a very good pay- paying job. Um, and, and that, and that I suppose I might have said this earlier. Newt Emerson makes it this analysis that you know I think uh, sorry, how, how I say one of his, his uncle I think was killed in right in, in, in the Banbridge Council he was, he was killed and a few days later he, he was on a cross community school trip and mm-hmm. everyone apologised and paid their respects and there's widespread revulsion. Whereas nowadays in that, that same school those two pupils may well say. All awful, but that was the it yeah. just had to happen. Because it's 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 more difficult to have that kind of attitude if the atrocities are actually happening at the time. But also, I think that in in a way that's kind of why this um, renewed feeling of what the IRA did was all right has come from because it's at such an historical distance. That but it doesn't can, have to be that way. That, that's no, because. Those people from that movement are now pushing that yeah. story. They're, they're, they're muddy in SLB and uh, it's a good muddy in Jerry Adams and John Hume, as we've seen in his passing. And that now you, you can see it with. Um, I'm not even mentioning that actually. But because of the Republican movement politically, have, have the ascendancy mm-hmm. in the Catholic Nationalist community. That's allowed them to plow forward with more, with rewriting history or, or tell, 
let it, letting the artistry yeah. come to the fore. It doesn't have to be that way. It could 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 have been humanism, you humans, and um, past. It could it could be. Um, yeah, but it could be in a way. It doesn't. It, this uh, ascent narrative, or yeah. whatever you want to want to call it, um, and yeah, the, I mean, um, my my friend David Hoey and, and Arthur Rocky, the, the historian, recently wrote a paper about this, and um, it, it's been sort of going around social media and other fora recently. People have been reading it; it's had a, a really sort of good response, but um, they've been looking at why this sort of caricature of history has, has become um, accepted. I mean, that, that they, would, they would blame, uh, <laughs> blame a lot of this on, on academics who come from a kind of traditional a tra transitional justice type of background. Yeah. And this I, idea that um, you're writing systemic wrongs in society rather than looking kind of at specific events and then even filling the, the context uh, behind them in that it kind of flattens everything out and provides. I think they, they, they loved the, the phrase that they came up with was that we ended up with a black taxi history tour of the troubles yeah. as the accepted narrative. And the idea of kind of going back and looking at the archives and looking at the facts and trying to build up a nuanced picture yeah. of both sides has completely gone by the wayside. And I don't know how we get that back. Maybe yeah. centenary is a good chance to reflect on that and, and try and you know have, have people look at what's happened over the past hundred years and build back a bit of nuance. Into yeah. It. We, we do have to say that. Um, Probably need to draw us to close soon enough. Um, I'll, I'll let you maybe raise any last issues or questions, but I just want to ask this quickly because uh, whilst I'm very much pro union and British, I'm also very Irish, mm -hmm. I don't see any oxymoron in looking to the whole island, chatting the whole island, being with the whole island. And I'm very much pro having good relations and getting on and intermingling. Clinton O'Toole, he said that. Uh, <laughs> He said Brexit's made a United Ireland more inevitable. Okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, but he said, but what hasn't happened and what needs to happen is, I can't remember exactly, but something to the effect of just basically humanism of if we are one island for two people, there's been no education or intermingling. Mm -hmm. People down, down south don't know or understand unionists. Like this RIC controversy, this national hysteria where the RIC were compared to the, the Nazis. Yeah, yeah. The, the the idea of two buckets are easier carried than one. The Seamus Heaney quote of unionists being embraced, welcome. That is far from reality. From what I'm seeing, if you look online, chat to people on the ground, it's like a niche academic talking point where the high up politicians seem to get it. Neil Martin, especially, he seems to get it. I like that too. Fianna Fáil was a bit oxymoronic. Worst Fine Gael, yeah, but too generally, yeah, less national party, really. Yeah, and academics, the people in the old seminars seem to get it. But I don't see any appetite or any efforts to inform, educate, and truly bring together. Mm -hmm. My experience on the ground is, as my friend said, you know, I didn't shoot you right back through. Um, my experience when I was in uh, Conceal and I was leaving the bar went at me when I was in Mahai, I didn't tell a dad story, I was having a big conversation with a guy at the, at the bar, he said, oh, I can tell you from that fast, you know, you're on and everything. And what was I speaking to the party with that accent? I don't know. And he said to me as I'm leaving, you know, this is our land before you, you all came in here. <clears throat> That, 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 that's, this is, this can't go forward like that. There has to no. be some sort of, well, if there was I mean, kind of quality the, party, just thinking gender means everything, it's not actually happening. I suppose that the first thing that I would say is that I reject that human idea of uh, unionism just being a culture or a tradition within the Irish nation, because that's really what he was implying. Um, 
what he was saying really was that your political allegiance to the United Kingdom, whatever you want to call it, is an illusion. Actually, you're part of this Irish nation and it's something that's cultural, that's put down to your identity and your tradition. I don't, I don't like that idea, although, I mean, I, I, I much prefer that kind of argument than somebody holding a bullet to you or holding yeah. a, a gun to your head or whatever. Um, but you're right. Now, I, I, I think of, um, I think of something that the, that Trevor England said actually um, about the the whole sort of push for shared Ireland and, and, and whatever else, and the, the, rea the reaction to the centenary argument. Why do you want to unite with one million people that you seem to despise? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's kind of what's coming through. And I, I suppose you're saying that Fintan O'Toole's kind of taking the the approach that we need to address, that, that nationalists need to address this and start to um, make unionists feel more welcome yeah. in that. Um, and you know that that that's all to the better. And if we can kind of if we can whatever our, our aspiration for the future is, if we can build relationships in the meantime and try to kind of promote what we're doing through that avenue, that would be a much healthier way of going about it. Um, but, and do, 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 I, do I see that happening? Not particularly, I think things are particularly kind of angsty at the moment and, and ill-tempered and, you know, it, it's it's funny to say that you know in a way relationships are nearly as bad now as they've been yeah. like, certainly since the the troubles. Yeah, and um, I just I just think it's remarkable this whole you know Sinn Féin their their constant talking point respect party disdain mm -hmm. um, no hierarchy of victims um, respect unions so on and so forth but you know park out for a second you, you are. In my eyes, a liberal modern unionist, mm -hmm. very secular, no good church. You just express basic unionist precepts yeah. and concepts, and because of that, you're labeled extreme or bigoted. I think work because unionism is so marginalized. Yet, I think that the I, I think that republicanism certainly, maybe even nationalism as a whole, has always struggled more with. Kind of civic unionism, UK basic yeah. unionism, as I would put it, than uh, the more kind of insular Northern Irish kind of cultural version, and that's probably because of that sort of latter version fits more easily into the Hume idea of things. You know, it, it can look like a tradition within Ireland, it, it's not really all that bothered about the Westminster link, it's not bothered about kind of building up. A national picture. What do you mean? Well, if, if politically you're more focused on the UK and you're, you're kind of talking about UK issues, you're engaging in, those, in, in UK politics and everything else, mm -hmm. um, it's less easy to portray you as just a, an adjunct of Irish culture, yeah. that you're just a tradition within the Irish nation who has this kind of legacy of British symbol symbolism or whatever, which I think is where, um, is how you know, a section of nationalism sees us. They don't think that our allegiance to the UK is genuine. They think that it's a legacy yeah, yeah, of yeah. Our colonialism yeah, or yeah. whatever. It's transitionary um, and it's transient and it's yeah. pass on. I, I suppose what I mean, uh, to, to take a, a, a good illustration of it, is the way that uh, Paisley used to <laughs> refer to the Brits, you know, he, in, a, in a derogatory way, yeah. referred to the government at Westminster the, uh, as the Brits. Um, and when it came to it, he found it easier to strike up relationships with Martin McGuinness. Yeah. Um, even um, David Trimble did with yeah. a mother, like Seamus Mann. Yeah, I, I, so, I, I, I've written about that, which I, you, you know, we talk about anglophobia from Republicans, mm -hmm. it's well documented, I never noticed, but there was a lot of mistrust and suspicion from loyalism and unionism of 
Chris and Peter had said that to, to McGuinness apparently. And they, yeah. you know, it's just, we can we can go, we don't need these guys here that that says Ulster nationalism coming in. Yeah, and I mean, it's not to condemn that out of hand either because there's people have definitely been let, let down on yeah. occasions by, uh, by Westminster throughout our history. And I mean, the, the latest example I think is the yeah. Ireland Protocol, which Boris Johnson, Conservative Party leader, before him, Theresa May, they swore blind that there was going to be nothing of the yeah, sort. Yeah. And then they, when it came down to it, they implemented that, or they, uh, it's going to be implemented. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I, I can relate to that anger and I can understand that anger. Yeah, I think, uh, but it's the kind of it's it's the other end. It's it's not feeling part of that. So you're speaking. You're, you're if you're describing people as the Brits, you feel that you're not part of that group, or you feel that you're something else. Yeah, um, and that was the kind of uh, that, that that Ulster nationalism is easier for Irish nationalism to fit into its worldview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, than it is a, a kind of a, a civic. Than civic unionism, which sees us as part of a bigger whole. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I think going back a bit, it's just quickly on what I was saying about the RIC thing, you know, and how I, I found this myself, I can't remember exactly what it is, but expressing basic unionist precepts and concepts mm-hmm. on social media, Twitter is the best example, but on Twitter, it's not representative. But just by expressing basic you know, concepts, it seems bigoted or progressive or whatever. Now, so th- this shouldn't be a shock that unionists are for the RIC. Yep. Unionists yep. do not support the Easter Rising. Unionists do not support armed rebellion against what Dublin Castle or whatever the, the administration in their it's history. Beautiful. Maintenance of law and order. Yes, yeah, well, their history is completely different from Republican 1960s history. So it's that is that the, the reaction to the attempt for a modest 15 minute ceremony to pay homage to the RIC that that caused national uproar show, shows the dereliction of duty in informing and educating this, the Irish people. About the need for a shared Ireland. Yeah. Well, that is a it, That's not. This is nothing extraordinary. Unionist people, Protestant <laughs> unionists, uh, kind of, they supported. It still would support the RIC. Yeah. So that is a, an indictment of this party, this thing, respect agenda. Yeah. That actually. They're, they're, they're not by and large, it's not. And if you look at what Bradford said in response to it, <coughs> Brexit, oh, Brexit makes United Ireland more inevitable. Well, this lack of parity, the same respect, understanding, open hand towards unionism, as exemplified by the RIC, um, thing shows, he, Bradford said, it's delayed mm-hmm. in United Ireland. Yeah. So there's a heck of a lot of work in, in my eyes. And I, I would be the party of party in Ireland school of thought that it can't be fifty percent plus one because then you're just going to create all sorts of mm-hmm. trouble. Um, by not br- bringing the, the, the two well, people together, I'm sympathetic to that. Um, but in a way, if I say that, if it, if, if I say that it can't be fifty yeah. percent plus one, I'm a hypocrite yeah. because, um, you know, I. I one of the things that that I, I bring out when uh, I, I bring out through my writing is that if the principle if, if we're going to accept the principle of consent, we have to be allowed to yeah. kind of full fat version of being yeah. part of the United Kingdom. We can't have it eroded. We can't yeah. be on a be a, I, I, I despise the, the the phrase a place apart. I don't want to be a place apart. Yeah. I want to be as much um, a part of the. UK, Scotland, or Wales, or, or even bits of England. Um, so, I mean, in theory, I have to accept that if our sovereignty is going to change, it does have to be on the basis of 50 yeah. percent plus one. Well, 50 percent plus one is good enough to keep it. 50 percent yeah. plus one is good enough to get resolved. Um, it, as I say, in a in a weird way, 
I always think he, that the, the worst outcome for me would be for Northern Ireland to be absorbed um, by the Irish Republic and then we keep some sort of form of devolution. We keep the assembly that we've got at Stormont. We keep our parties. We keep our, uh, our, our sort of little petty squabbles. If we're gonna have it, just let's yeah. have the, the full thing and let's sort of see if we can kind of argue about um, everyday matters and left and right and the rest of it yeah. because um, you know that to, to be within an all Ireland state and still have Sinn Féin and the DUP squabbling up at Stormont would be probably my worst case scenario. Yeah. So just quickly on this, so for all the work of parties in respect that hasn't been done, mm -hmm. as I just said, if you look at all the party in the respect work that has been done by the Republican movement, are they not making a rod for their own back? Because if these symbols that are so offensive to people and the flags have been taken down in are restricted, if there's a United Ireland, should these oh. symbols on behalf of the minority not be restricted? I, I think they've got a credibility issue there because on one hand, they're demanding that um, they, they, they sort of take that, they got the, um, take away what symbols of Britishness there are in Northern Ireland. On the other hand, they're saying, well, if you, if you're going to be part of our all Ireland state, then you're going to be treated with generosity and your symbols will be uh, there and everything else. So I, I don't see why you would believe that line that suddenly when you get into an all Ireland context rather than a Northern Ireland context, um, there's going to be more respect accorded to the symbols of unionism, the symbols of, of, uh, of the United Kingdom. Or it's clearly bogus. Look at the RIC, yeah. it's a barometer. RIC, you can't even have a simple dignified 15 minute ceremony. How, how are you going to have yes. RUC or anything British related? It, it's not a big ask. It's not going to impact on, on people all that much. It's just a symbolic thing. It's a um, it's a respect thing. It's about uh, it's about respecting somebody else's view of history and, and not trying to claim that you've got a, a monopoly on on that story. But they, as things stand, they do. I think that's the I think that's the tendency, and I would love to. Yeah, I I, I don't know um, whether this has come from the teaching of history. I I, I can't. Um, can't comment with any kind of authority on whether if you if you if you were to go into you know, the average school in the Republic of Ireland, whether they're teaching a nuanced version of Irish history, whether they're explaining the fact that unionists have a view on it that's uh, that's different from nationalism and that it's not and that's important to understand that rather than just treat that as some sort of anomaly or something to be uh, to be whitewashed. Um, I would like to hope that there is that kind of nuance because I mean, I remember when I was uh, at school reading Irish history, one of the kind of great textbooks that you would have um, been reading was Modern Ireland by R. F. Foster. And yeah. So e even even then, kind of going back to the early nineties or mid nineties, whatever, it was all there that uh, that kind of um, more nuanced portrayal of things. But then you know. You, you don't have to go far to see R. F. Foster uh, portrayed as a revisionist and, and mm. uh, given all sorts of abuse for that. So I would like to hope that there's a more that there's there's not that kind of cartoon history being uh, being taught through the schools. But I mean, you <coughs> have to get, the the R. I. C. thing is kind of a perfect example of where you do wonder. Yeah. Well, the, the whole reason if I can just say quickly for doing this podcast was. Just you know, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm young enough, and I'm, I'm very in touch with social media. I can see online youth culture, and from what I can see, um, these accounts are um, very geared towards telling history. This 
more on top, basically uh, out of the Republican movement, that the, the police were an occupying force, the RUC were an occupying force of yeah. sorts, and that young, um, these uh, Republican volunteers were no, no, noble free freedom fighters. I think it's the kind of history that even sort of a fairly short period of time ago you thought of as the history of a, of a kind of hard line minority, but yet it does seem to have become common currency. And I know that there was always a, 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 a nationalist view of history and a unionist view of history, but I think there was more appreciation um, that there were there was more than one version of history and that you had to kind of dig in you have to dig into it and look at all sides before you kind of came to your view on it. I, I don't really see that so much anymore. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, but of course, I mean, we're, we're talking about Twitter and, and that's not necessarily, it's, it, it's, it's emblematic of a certain, you know, the section of society, but it's not necessarily the be all and end all. Maybe, yeah. maybe we simply, <clears throat> through the kind of uh, things that we do, maybe we spend too much time yeah. Um, to too much store by it or something. Yeah. But then um, that, that's a, a common problem because, like, yeah, politicians are doing yeah. that too. Labour will labour to be talk at the last election because they thought Twitter was going to convert into like a landslide on the on the rural wing, but they didn't. Um, my quick question to ask, and um, you know, I, I worked for a think tank as, a, as an intern very briefly in England and in London. And yeah. actually pro union, and uh, it's just fascinating to be part of that machinery of analysing uh, newspaper editorials from right across Europe. Yeah, the Italians, French, German, uh, process it in the morning, put out a press briefing, and they would work on monthly reports talking about the pros and cons of uh, the UK's link with Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was slightly pro European but critical too. Um, I've long, well, for the last year or two, made the point that. Um, you know, union, unionism is more or less inept when it comes to PR and as you said, you know, setting our guiding principles and tell a part of the story of what we want. Um, that would be my argument that there should be a strong, robust think tank, um, secular, slightly pro-union but critical. What yeah. was it, is there maybe comment on that or anything as, as, as we wrap up and looking towards the future? I would, I would love to see something like that. I would love to see a more um, positive message coming out of, uh, of unionists of, of unionism as, as a whole. I think um, I, I think the starting point is to get that those kind of basics right, and then to start think about thinking about what you what you want rather than just what you're opposed to. And um, you know, we, we, we keep having this debate in unionism at the moment about should we engage in the conversation about um, a United Ireland mm -hmm. or whatever, and people have different views on that. But what I would say is that while you can engage in that debate at some level, what you've got to not do is do it on nationalism, nationalism's terms. Yeah. You've got to be uh, going into it with your own aims and objectives and um, what we've got to do is, is start just selling what we want and making what we want clear and not just saying that you know we, we, we know that we don't want uh, an all-Ireland state you know that's taken as taken as a given um, but if we're going to actually persuade people that it's better to be part of the United Kingdom let's tell them why that's important and that's Tell them how we see that developing. Yeah, how we see it developing at all. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, I I think I don't I don't have any more to say today. Um. Is there any other issues or topics you could? Um. No, I, I, no, I, I'm I'm happy to leave it at that, Brian. Yeah. We've had a good good discussion. <laughs> you're, you're very much in like what the podcast should be twenty thirty minutes. And I will well I have to with I should plug our own yeah, uh, podcast. Uh, uh, David Hoey and I have a podcast called Political OD that you can find on most of the, it's on Spotify, it's on Podbean, Pocket Casts, yeah. you know, iTunes if you're an Apple person. Yeah. Um, 
But yes, we, we, we try and stick to 20 minutes and we hit sort of two or three. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's not uh, been as discursive as we've had today, but we'll, we'll hit two or three, two or three topical uh, yeah. sort of issues of the day. It's, more about, it's more about issues of the day rather yeah, yeah. than um, you know, looking at the kind of philosophies behind things and history and, it, and everything else, which I think is a, a great perspective too. Yeah, hopefully I'm sort of learning as, as we go along. Um, and then I'll include your Twitter and stuff in the in yep. the links below. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah. And you um, can read your stuff through that. Yes, absolutely. I, I generally use my Twitter really to promote my work. I'm not a, I'm not a great sort of <coughs> user of Twitter. Other than that, I don't. Yeah. Know, I, I don't um, I, sometimes people are critical of that. They kind of say, "Oh, you 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 don't engage." But I, you know, I I've got. Two boys, two and yeah. four. I, I don't have the time to sit there at night, yeah. responding um, to all comers. That's, I that's like the, your, the your, your 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 up post about how it's like uh, bad for you. Like you know, you can be a, you yeah. can be addicted to drink and drugs. You can also be addicted to social media or something. You said. Or you're posting I, I think you can. I think I was talking about people who you know make very kind of personal revelations on on Twitter, which seems to be a big thing, and and there's a big kind of culture as well of liking that and sharing it and it's seen as that's seen as something that's healthy good for your mental health to, to get it all out there on twitter i i can definitely see the kind of uh, the, the mental health aspect when it comes to sharing with people that yeah. are uh, sharing with people in person sharing with friends with family yeah. with, or with, with a professional but i'm i'm not I'm not sure it's the wisest thing to get all your little yeah. personal foibles and addictions and any struggles that you have in your life out in that kind of really public format because yeah. you've got to remember that you're publishing it for the world and yeah. not just it's a bit faddish and um, it's not real and, and, and yeah. there's, a, there's the, the whole abuse and bullying and just mental health aspect of it and it's just not good going to bed in the middle of the twitter argument and waking up to it and, well, i know what i i my, on my phone you can turn it off at half yeah. nine at night and i've got that set up do. and that's the best thing I've ever done because yeah. half nine it locks me out good I can't see it till the next morning need more of that so uh yeah on that note um we'll end it there thanks so much for coming in great not at all <laughs> enjoyed it <laughs> I hope so I hope um people do too and sort of wing it a wee bit okay, okay. I'll close that off now